everyone and welcome back to THE Live US. We will now continue with our fourth session of the day entitled Innovative Universities of the Future. Before that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please do post any questions for the next panel into the Q&A box on the side of your screen. This session does include a live Q&A, so please do post your questions into the chat box and these will be picked up by our moderator. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jay Deshmukh, who is an Associate Senior Architect with IBI Group. Over to you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, I, my name is Jay Deshmukh, and as Hannah said, I'm an architect uh, with IBI Group. And the way that we began this conversation comes from some research that I've done over the past year. Um, I've spent most of my career looking at uh, projects for higher education, um, campus architecture really, and believing that um, the environment is the third is the third teacher, if you will, so that the environment actually matters um, in order to support uh, learning outcomes. And I'm happy to see that I am joined by my co-presenter, David Staley, who is a historian and futurist at the Ohio State University. And um, as circumstances have it, he's joining us uh, from his car. So, so much for being agile and nimble. Uh, here we are. Um, I, David and I got speaking um, about the future of campus, if you will, uh, because he was actually one of the people I interviewed for my uh, post-pandemic campus um, research. And uh, David had written a book a couple of years ago. And David, are you able to join in now? And uh, maybe you can introduce yourself and, and how we got acquainted and pulled this together. Well, uh, first of all, tell me if you can hear me OK. We can. Good. So uh, I'm David Staley, a uh, professor of history at uh, The Ohio State University. And as Jay says, uh, we, uh, we were introduced to each other by a mutual colleague. Uh, and uh, he thought that what would uh, really connect us would be the, uh, the book that I wrote a couple of years ago called Alternative Universities. And uh, to, uh, to make a long and yet fruitful collaboration uh, short, uh, we've, uh, we've been uh, thinking a lot together about how to turn the conceptual designs that I laid out in that book uh, into something that would be an actual university. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, we actually have a presentation to go along with the concepts we'd like to share with you today. So if I can ask for the uh, presentation to be brought up, please. Um, terrific. So as, as uh, David just mentioned, uh, what we'd like to do really is to look at how the pandemic is causing us to look at the academic structures of universities differently. And for persons like myself, who are architects and designers, who actually want to draw from that academic structure in, in informing uh, the design of a campus, how the two might um, might influence each other and how we might be able to look at innovation as a driving force um, for the future of the campus, both in terms of um, education itself, but also uh, the design of the spaces that support that education. Um, so David, if I can turn it uh, back to you to address this. So uh, as, uh... As we see in the uh, image that we have there in that first slide, uh, Jay and I have both been uh, influenced, I think, by Black Mountain College in North Carolina, but especially the idea of reinvention. Uh, and I think by extension, the idea of innovation, uh, that, uh, that, that one thing that higher education, especially American higher education needs, is a reinvigorated sense of what innovation means. And I think if we go to the next slide, I think we just have a statement here about the necessity of, uh, of, um, of innovation. And uh, let me just, so yes, and that next slide is just fine. So I think that we tend to use the word innovation a little, uh, a little too frequently, a little so loosely today that, uh, that the word has uh, sort of been emptied of its meaning. We think of sort of any change at any scale as an innovation, and I would, uh, and I think we would like to draw a distinction between uh, 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 change that is innovative, 
uh, versus maybe change that is incremental. This is a quote from uh, Philip Rogers that I saw a few years ago. And as you can see, it says, the future success of university presidents will depend on their ability to reinvent themselves and their institutions every five years to keep up with the pace of change. Now, if we take Rogers at, uh, at, his, at his word, and I do, and if, and, and if we agree with his assessment, that would seem to be a very, very tall order for most of our institutions to reinvent themselves. Uh, it's that process of reinvention, if it's, if it's our goal, if it's our strategic goal, I think of what we mean by, uh, by innovation. If you go to the next slide, this lays out five challenges that Jay and I see facing higher education. This was true even before the pandemic. So these are accessibility, affordability, accountability, sustainability, and the final one is differentiation. We've separated that because in my estimation, differentiation is maybe the most critical. I'm not dismissing those other challenges. They're, they're of course, very important. But I think the lack of differentiation in our institutions of higher education is maybe at root of a lot of the other problems that we're seeing in higher education. I think it has to do with benchmarking, I think, or maybe it's benchmarking gone awry institutions look at other institutions and say, well, we have to be like them. And as a result, uh, we tend to have institutions that start to look more and more like delivering the same services. We're seeing so many institutions right now that are cutting programs so as to focus on workforce development skills or uh, to demonstrate their responsiveness to the workforce. But one result of that is that institutions start to look more and more alike. And if you go to the next slide, one of the results of this is that uh, the pandemic has accelerated a trend that we've been looking at, which is the commoditization. I wrote that slide wrong. It, that says commodification. I meant to say commoditization of higher education. And in any mature industry, commoditization means that you are competing with other institutions largely on price. What we're seeing in higher education is a race to, de uh, to deliver higher education in an efficient way, usually sort of online, but at lower cost. That this is the only way that institutions are thinking about in terms of how they're going to differentiate each other. That is the very definition of a commoditized industry. We have been uh, approaching this issue from a different direction. And that's the next slide that you see there uh, with, my, with my book, where, uh, where we're talking about expanding, we're inviting everyone on this call to expand their strategic imagination and to embrace the idea of enterprise level innovation. In other words, thinking about the purpose and mission of our institutions and innovating there not innovation in adding a new program or how we might teach differently, but in the very mission and very purpose of our institutions. It's there that we think that real innovation can occur. And um, so what, what David and I looked at um, through our conversations about trying to find a physical form that the university might take and to assist this imagination by helping to visualize um, these concepts, these kind of conceptual models that um, David studied and proposes in his book, um, he proposes many more than five. Um, we selected to look at five specific ones that we thought were in some ways the the sort of most relevant, if you will, both in terms of the nature of um, impact of the sort of post pandemic thinking, if you will, but also closest to a larger group of uh, universities or uh, colleges. Um, I'd like to point out that we use the word university quite inclusively in that uh, we may use the term university, but that does not preclude uh, community colleges or any other kind of institute for higher education. So what what you see here is a, a, a fairly long list of different models, uh, conceptual models that uh, David looks at, and we selected to look at five of them that what you will see us do next is that we will go through every one of the five. Um, David will introduce the conceptual model, and then we'll start talking about the kinds of activities that we might see there and how the physical spaces might support them. 
Um, we will also look at a few precedents um, in order to help us visualize this because we do appreciate that we're asking for some several leaps of imagination to be made in this kind of strategic reinvention. Um, the only thing I will add to that based on this research that I've done, um, and I spoke with people at, in more than 30 countries um, just to contextualize uh, where this comes from, and you can definitely see how the cost of education um, has a very strong impact on what universities want to do and this commoditization that David just spoke about. Um, so um, with, with no further ado, let's uh, go to the first one then, David, uh, microcolleges. Yes, and before I introduce that, I just want to uh, add a coda to what you said, uh, Jay. The five that we selected, I think, were the five that you were particularly drawn to. Uh, it's true. And especially uh, how that these conceptual uh, models uh, could be made physical. And so you were you were sort of putting on your architect hat, I think. And so uh, wanna, we want to give credit where credit's due. So uh, the, the first of these uh, we call micro college. And the idea is that there's more than just one micro college. In fact, there are thousands of them because a micro college is made up of one faculty and 20 students. And that's the college. Uh, and so uh, again, we see uh, a model where there's lots and lots of these. Uh, if you're looking for a precedent, that's the uh, image there on the right. That would be uh, Deep Springs College in the Sierra Nevadas, uh, where there, I think there are three faculty in fact, but 27 students. But it gives you a sense of the scale of the enterprise that we're talking about. If you go to the next slide. So what's happening inside the micro college that, that we list this under activity? The idea is that uh, the way the academic life would be structured would be there would be seminars uh, between uh, faculty and groups of students, uh, technologically mediated self-paced courses of the kind that we're seeing uh, in more and more cases, a weekly faculty convocation, Oxford style tutorials, and that where the faculty member is working with say two or three students at a time. And it should also be said peer to peer learning as well. This really would be a community, uh, a learning community. Jay? Right. And so um, in terms of the kinds of the spatial characteristics of such a place, um, one of them is that learning can occur everywhere. Um, I'm sure even before the pandemic, we talked a lot about this kind of continuum between living and learning, if you will. We uh, frequently talked about the fact that students at least are living these kind of 24 seven lives. And it sort of builds upon this. And we know, for instance, that e even through the pandemic, we saw a lot of students you know, find ways to, to work with their peers, um, whether it be because students actually rented a place together and fo formed their own kind of micropod, if you will, and, and then connected with virtual education. So we know that some of these behaviors have actually already been triggered, if you will. Um, certainly the concept of micro schools for K through 12 education is gaining more and more sort of attention. So the idea that learning is everywhere, um, as, as David mentioned, the, both the the relationships with the tutor and the peer are pretty important. And if I could jump to the last one in that list, the notion that living and learning is actually together is an interesting one. Um, for a long time on campuses, there's been a pretty large debate on how important it is for um, you know, student engagement, retention, you know, graduation rates, whether it's important for students to be on campus and whether they need to be part of that, um, that, um, that journey together. And and we do find, as I just mentioned, that that component of living together and being part of a community is fairly critical, particularly for that sort of traditional uh, university age student. Um, and so again, uh, the other second point that, that will come up a fair bit with many of these models is the notion of individual choice. So in order to have these institutions that are you know, fairly small, we know that they're guided very much by individual choice and journeys. Again, another conversation that's been around for a long time, but that's probably amplified uh, post pandemic. Um, I'd like to show you a couple. 
advancing here? Here you go. So uh, again, uh, to help visualize these things, the image you see here is actually a space that created a micro college um, more than two decades ago. Um, it's the home of my uh, graduate professor in North Carolina. And uh, the word guru kul means the home of the teacher. I am sure the word guru is pretty familiar to many people. Um, so the reason I show this as a precedent is because he actually held his graduate seminar in his living room and this, the size of the class was actually limited uh, to the number of seats that could be comfortably seated in his in his living space. And again, back to the notion that space does influence, you know, the man, the nature of the discussion, the kind of Socratic room space that he was creating. Certainly this this room allowed us to have very different conversations than if we had been at campus, you know, five minutes away from where this this image was taken. So there's also a secondary thread in here about, you know, even undergrad graduate education taking on qualities of graduate education in the sense that they would be more about individual journeys and, and discovery, if you will. Uh, the second precedent that we'd like to look at is to David's point that there would be, you know, potentially hundreds of, of these uh, of these institutions that may or may not have, uh, you know, strong or loose connections with each other. So, um, again, this is a, a diagram really that's talking about the fact that there could be many, many such uh, places, these institutions, these micro colleges could live across a certain region and they could connect um, in many different different ways. Again, they could be fluid with time as well. And we know, for instance, that what this starts to do is set up things uh, that are increasingly being called learning ecosystems or even learning cities for that matter. And uh, I, I recently attended a, a lecture that suggests that the city of Medellin in, in Colombia may have some, some excellent lessons for us on this front. Uh, we'll go to the next one, David. So uh, our second model is called Nomad University. And I, uh, keeping in mind, I wrote this uh, before the pandemic when, uh, when, when movement, I think, was uh, less complicated. The idea here is that uh, Nomad University exists, well, sort of everywhere. Uh, it's based on the idea that students and teachers travel around the globe. Uh, they, they form and reform in different places and learn in place. So maybe that's uh, engaging in a, uh, uh, an irrigation project in sub-Saharan Africa, or maybe it's uh, community policing issues in Baltimore, or maybe it's going to Athens and reading, uh, the, uh, reading Socrates. In other words, the, the place where education occurs is sort of everywhere. There is not a central location per se. There's not you know, classrooms as we sort of traditionally think about them. And the model here, or at least one model, uh, well, uh, the, the model that I was using for the book uh, was uh, the, the gap year experience. Uh, though what you're looking at here is uh, the grand tour of Europe, right? The 19th century grand tour of Europe. So Nomad University is literally a university that is located across the globe. Next slide, please. So again, the idea here is of learning in place and that place matters uh, in this education. Um, uh, that uh, being in, or learning in different parts of the world does not mean just simply dropping in as a tourist, but uh, that you're also learning uh, intercultural negotiation uh, as part of this. So whatever other, uh, whatever else you're learning in place, uh, you, are, you are learning to negotiate a different culture. Uh, apprenticeship, clearly this is based on something like an apprenticeship model uh, and independent and group projects. Right. And from from a, a, to add to this, uh, one of the models that's been looked at a fair bit and includes the image that you see of students on a screen relates to uh, Minerva, which has been talked about quite a lot, where effectively there they are a version of Nomad College, if, if you were to think about it that way. The difference is, of course, they're moving a whole cohort of students around who are sort of in the same year, if you will, the same sort of graduate year. In this case, um, David goes a lot further just talk about you know nomads who really are looking at individual journeys although they do plug themselves into the communities and then will have uh, you know a different set of peers 
um, as they move around. Um, I, I think we didn't really address this too much, but we did talk about the concept of a home base and, and the idea of apprenticeship. We know again, pre-pandemic itself, there are uh, there has been a lot of movement for in, at many institutions to really grow the component of hands-on experiential learning, even work immersed learning. So we know that there are several institutions that are already looking at students spending time on campus versus off campus in apprentice type roles. So just pointing out that some of these ideas have been percolating away in one form or the other, you know, for, for some time now. So again, to David's point, the context would matter. It would be a very important component of, of the learning. And we also know that that partnership would matter, that, um, that the students would, would engage in these various locations and effectively, you know, um, create learning spaces where they are. Um, sorry, I went too fast there. So one of the uh, precedents that you can see here as an image is actually a space that was created um, at Cornell University. In fact, they, they formed a new um, center for excellence that then turned into a faculty in a sense, an interdisciplinary faculty for human ecology. And the reason this is it becomes a precedent is that the design students from Cornell University actually spent time, uh, this is a project done by my firm out of New York City, and the design students actually spent time working with the, um, the professional designers who were working on the project and in the design of the space that you see in front of you. And this space has in fact turned into a crossroads that is either a kind of a hangout um, space. It's one of those multifunctional, polyfunctional spaces, if you will, where on any given day, you can have uh, very diverse things, whether it be small group interaction or a fashion show, as you see in this case. So the point it's trying to make is that that apprenticeship model uh, can extend extend um, engagement of students outside of the campus a fair bit. The second one then is also looking at the precedent where in fact entire cities are thinking in this manner and again the the threshold between campus and cities starts to become very very much flu much more fluid than potentially it is right now um, and this precedent looks at the city of Rotterdam where multiple universities uh, come together to create this um, you know to, to create a kind of a landscape a framework where students as well as sorry campuses as as well as industry are working together so that the potential for the port of, Rat of Rotterdam to actually become um, almost like an innovation district, if you will. Again, these ideas have been percolating, but they are often things that take students away from campus. And what, what we're looking at is can that actually become the campus, if you will, the city as campus, if you will, industry as campus, if you will. Um, the next one. David, are you able to address this with platform? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, and before I get to platform, I'll just uh, sort of reiterate, uh, since we've talked about two of these so far, we haven't, uh, in some ways, we haven't talked about curriculum. We haven't talked about the um, the, uh, the sort of the specifics of the curriculum. Again, we really are talking here about the overall mission and purpose. Uh, and I hope uh, so far that everyone sees that the models that we're proposing really represent very different ways of thinking about what a university is. Uh, not just simply the courses that it delivers or is it, uh, uh, is it uh, connected to, uh, to marketplace uh, uh, demand. Uh, we really are imagining very different differentiated ways of thinking about a university experience. So yes, that takes us to the platform university. And a plat platform university is organized like a multi-sided platform, which is defined as uh, any organization or an organization that connects producers and consumers. And we'll look at some precedents uh, uh, for that. But the one that I always like to think of as uh, maybe the ultimate platform is Burning Man, which is of course the image that you're looking there. Uh, Burning Man, you know, sort of provides the, you know, the, the space, you come to the desert, but what happens there at Burning Man, I mean, aside from Burning Man being burned, uh, is, well, it's up to the participants. So it's a, so platform university would be a physical space that's facilitating interactions between teachers and students, but that this space is agnostic 
about the particular intellectual exchanges or the academic activities that occur. That's determined by the interaction of teachers and students and therefore is emergent and unplanned. And if we go to the next slide, this I think is uh, exemplified in the activities. We uh, define the activities uh, at Platform Universities, uh, at Platform University as uh, containing self-organizing classes, uh, self-organizing curricula, you get enough of these classes together, a curricula forms. Uh, it implies a very minimal administrative structure. In fact, the stability and coherence of these kinds of platforms is maintained through community protocols. Uh, and this is a space for both formal and informal learning. But again, the idea of emerging class, emergent classes, emergent curriculum, maybe is one of the largest takeaways from the idea of platform university. Jay? Right. And in terms of spatial characteristics, this one gets really interesting because what we're effectively saying is that if the spaces are, if the, if the university itself is talking about facilitating interactions, that becomes its most important spatial characteristic as well in order to kind of connect people, bring people together, but then offer up effectively a rather large palette of spaces, whether they're small, medium or large, to allow the interactions to happen um, and to, to actually allow those interactions to change in terms of, um, you know, being able to have spaces that are reconfigurable, that are scalable. Uh, they would probably need an incredibly strong infrastructure backbone in terms of, you know, a modular a system of structure and, um, you know, um, IT, AV, that sort of thing, if one actually went into the details of it. But the interconnectedness of it and the reconfigurable uh, qualities would be the most important. Um, the interconnectedness of it would also allow to have to engage curiosity and discovery as people move through it. So you can understand how, um, you know, not being silos would be incredibly important in this kind of activity where you know that the the vibrance of the educational experience actually comes from that fluid interconnectedness and the kind of serendipity that that could occur in spaces like this so in terms of you know, the, the, this is the classic one. This is the classic um, kind of precedent, which I would say as architects, one tends to look at for all and everything, if you will, um, the kind of ultimate precedent, if you will, where the agora, which was the central space, the central gathering space um, in the ancient um, city of Athens that had numerous different types of activities that could take place um, because it actually brought the citizenry together. Um, and this kind of place where, uh, you know, business and the market and the courts, all of them were, you know, occurring around a kind of a central plaza space that was really part of the daily lives of people and which honestly has influenced the design of many, many campuses that actually talk about creating these places where their campus community intersects. Typically, though, the, those spaces are often the places in between. They're often the places that are not directly concerned with uh, the learning process, if you will. They're often part of the social life of a campus, but not so much the academic life. And I think that's that's part of uh, the kind of reinvention that, that we would like you to think about. Um, the ancient city of Fez was very similar in which a similar kind of setup was actually in the marketplace, but actually allowed uh, scholars to come together in, in a similar space. Um, the next precedent that I can give you is a much more uh, recent one. Uh, I had cause to be engaged with a project where an entirely new campus was being set up. Um, from the sands, if you will, in, in, in Dubai. And what you're seeing here is almost a Mobius strip of space, the green space that you can see kind of snaking its way around, which really was a campus without faculties. There were no kind of discipline boundaries at all. It was also the kind of campus that was going to respond in terms of its offering uh, to the market. It was going to be very responsive based on, you know, where is, uh, you know, what are our students interested in learning? What kinds of subjects are now gaining traction in our, in our students? What does the workforce need and what do we need to prepare um, you know, from the standpoint of the region and its economic outlook? And so what you had is within the green space, a real series of spaces that were either for you know, small, medium or large groups for formal or informal learning. 
around seminars as much as project rooms. And then the blue spaces were things like libraries and student um, uh, student hubs and, and uh, club rooms that actually joined the campus together. And, and at the time, I was frequently saying that I couldn't imagine doing something like this in North America. But once again, I want to suggest that um, things really are changing. And in my conversations um, in, over the past year, the idea that we could actually be looking past faculties as being the definition, um, the sort of defining element for a physical campus is slowly starting to, to gain traction. Um, next one, David. Um, facilitating teachers and learners uh, as the starting point of the, the way a, uh, a, a university unfolds. I just sort of love that idea. Uh, as, I, as I also love the idea of polymathy University. So there's been a lot of attention drawn uh, to sort of the history of polymath and sort of the status of the polymath today. Uh, there's been a, a, a really interesting book uh, published recently by uh, Wakas Ahmed called uh, The Polymath. Uh, but immediately people sort of say, well, you know, maybe someone like Da Vinci could be a polymath because someone like that could, you know, at least conceivably, know everything that was knowable in the, uh, in the 15th century. It's just simply not possible in the 21st century. Well, the idea of a polymath university is not based on students sort of knowing everything. Uh, it's actually grounded in disciplines. The idea of polymath university is that students here as a condition of graduation are expected to triple major in three disparate subjects. And so in the book, I divide them up roughly into sort of the professions, the sciences, including social sciences and the arts and humanities. And the student sort of chooses from one of each. And so as I write here, uh, maybe that student majors in history and accounting and biology, or another student majors in finance or English or chemistry. The idea is that by choosing three very different majors, the student learns to think in three different ways. It's almost like being a polyglot uh, or knowing many languages. These are students that would be trained to know or to think in many disciplines. And for me, a discipline is more than just simply a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. It's a, it's a habit of mind. And so the idea of polymath university would be to educate students to have these very flexible uh, habits of mind, and therefore to approach problems from different ways simultaneously. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can look at some of the activities. And one of these is most certainly the idea of analogical thinking, that this reminds me of this. And having a deep immersion in three disparate disciplines helps to develop that sort of analogical view of the world. Uh, as is cognitive toggling, as I say, students at Polymath University would have this capacity to toggle between different forms of knowing, different ways of knowing, again, not just simply different bodies of knowledge. Um, as I say, they would develop different ha disciplinary habits of mind, but multiple such habits of mind. I think that there is a, uh, there's a, uh, an analogy here to be made, as I say, between being a polyglot, between knowing many languages and the cognitive effects of that and knowing many disciplines, uh, which is what we would be wanting to develop at, uh, at Polymath University. Uh, and uh, well, active counseling, uh, maybe uh, Jay could talk a little more about uh, what's involved there. Right. Um, and I might actually go a little bit uh, quicker through this because we are getting some questions coming in, David, and I'd like us to hold on to at least five minutes to address them. Um, so I think, you know, probably the, the most important characteristics that I'd like to point out here is porosity between schools. Um, in fact, um, one might actually, you know, consider what those schools are and how we may be able to define what schools are. Um, you know, be, not necessarily along the lines of their physical spaces. So um, if there is a kind of porosity across them, one can start to imagine uh, almost the ground plane of a university effectively being, being a space that everybody engages in and, and finding ways for it to truly be transdisciplinary. Um, I think the uh, examples might offer, offer the cues a little bit better. Um, we actually returned to Black Mountain College here, um, oh, which was a bit of a touchstone for us. Um, this was this is a, a, a plan for it, which was never quite realized. So the campus was, um, you know, in the mountains of, of North Carolina. And the idea here was 
um, that the dining space and library, the sort of largest trapezium shaped space that you're seeing over there, effectively becomes everybody's crossroads. And um, that's the manner in which they actually were creating a place where students could determine their own ways of intersection between subject matter, if you will. So people weren't necessarily graduating in any, any one discipline, um, as David mentioned, but actually in multiple disciplines. And the fact that the hearth was incredibly important um, and th th became the, the crossroads of, of the campus itself. The second example that I can offer up is in, in Lausanne. Um, this was a polytechnic that began as uh, um, began with the idea that there would be multiple spaces that would then be scaled up. So in the drawing that you're, the plan that you're seeing over here, um, each one of the little squares, if you will, they almost began at the beginning. Uh, they began sort of at the center, sorry, and then grew. Um, so the full build out, and it's actually grown a lot more than, than this image from the 60s shows, is that they were pods that kept growing on themselves as uh, the different uh, typologies of spaces increased, whether they were from workshops, in this case it was a polytechnic, so there were spaces uh, for sort of uh, lect or knowledge gaining type spaces and, and many, many more experiential learning type spaces. Um, the important thing in this is these kind of two axes that you see cutting across them. And the idea being that those particular pathways would allow that co-mingling to occur and, and draw students into uh, different activities that they weren't necessarily um, uh, you know, planning to planning to participate in, but that curiosity would lead them and discovery would lead them in their their learning journey as well. Um, and here's sort of the last one that we'd like to talk about today. So the Institute for Advanced Play, and very simply, the Institute places play as the highest form of learning above knowledge. At universities, we say knowledge, either the creation of knowledge or the dissemination of knowledge is the highest goal. The Institute for Advanced Play is play. As the scholar uh, Miguel Seichert reminds us, uh, a playground, and if we think of the university or as, a, as a playground in this instance, is a location specifically created to accommodate play, but does not impose any particular type of play, set of activity, purpose, or goal, or reward, or, or reward structure. And if you go to the next slide, uh, I'm going to uh, be fairly specific about what I mean, because when we play, when we say play, that sounds like what children do, and it is indeed what children do, but it's also something that adults should do because play involves imagination and curiosity and hacking and what we might call unlearning or the beginner's mind. Uh, it's the sort of behaviors found in artist studios, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of experimenting and tinkering. Uh, clearly, this is a very self-guided uh, approach to learning. Jay? Yeah, um, what I'd like to add to that is what I'd like to add to that is just the notion that um, the experimentation itself, the process of it, the asking of the right questions, and uh, the process of trying to discover the answers to them is incredibly important to, to this kind of school. And um, I'm sure everybody's heard about learning, relearning, unlearning, you know, the idea of allowing people to fail. Um, and so many of these examples that we're showing here are often ones that are related to uh, another sort of phrase that is trickling about everywhere is design thinking. And, and what does that really mean? It is a kind of an iterative process of, of building ideas, testing ideas. Um, and the, the examples that we can offer up are actually quite incredible they're they're really quite real if i might put it that way um Indeed. you know can the early childhood education was greatly influenced by uh radio emilia um, and um what we saw there is the notion that young children are going to actually learn through pro a process of discovery uh, that involves them engaging in multiple diff different activities in the same space that the, that the teachers are actually more like mentors. And this concept was taken forward very strongly while the image you see here is, is of that early uh, childhood space. The concept was taken forward very strongly by MIT Media Lab, which actually has an entire space devoted to what they call lifelong kindergarten. And what they're looking at is exactly this, this kind of learning through play, learning through imagination, through testing, 
um, through experiment, uh, you know, will you know fail uh, fail early, if you will, revise, retest. Um, and uh, this concept of lifelong kindergarten is slowly making its way through K through 12 a fair bit. And uh, we'd like to suggest that it actually has a life uh, beyond um, elementary and secondary school. And in fact, at the university level. And so finally, the last sort of example we'd like to give you is, is a, another sort of favorite for David and myself, which is um, Cedric Price created what he called conceptual models for laboratories of fun and they were meant to be interspersed in places that had lost a lot of their populations in in northern england actually um, and places where people could actually explore and um, another sort of precedent you could you could bring to this is the way museums have changed the way uh, they want to go from displaying artifacts to being places where people actually connect with objects and test things and test concepts and ideas. And so uh, what's really incredible about it is that the Fun Palace actually has a life of its own now. And there are places in uh, the UK that have actually gone ahead and built uh, these spaces, which are essentially sort of factories for fun and, and discovery. Uh, so that that would be the sort of um, last one we'd like to leave you with. And um, if all of this sounds rather too radical, I'd like to suggest that, you know, there's a way we can think about this and we'd like to leave you with some questions around that relate to these ideas that we have uh, shared with you. And um, maybe we can uh, tackle some of the questions that have come through. I'll just uh, take a look at them now. I'm unable to see them, Jay. So uh, yeah, I'm going to read them. I'm going to read them to you, uh, David, and maybe we can uh, take them on. So one of them says, "Will the much discussed hybrid model end up deepen deepening the divide between students from varying backgrounds? Is on-campus learning going to become a privilege?" This this one comes really close to my heart. Um, I have to say, my response to this is, I think that we have to find uh, ways to really reinvent the campus so that it becomes, it, that it's not an either or situation. Maybe that's the best way I can put this is that I would like to imagine a hybrid future where we harness, um, where we harness the possibilities that virtual education, the flexibility that it offers us, but doesn't take away from the incredibly important role that physical space plays in terms of deepening understanding, deepening relationships, so that there is actually a kind of an ebb and a flow, if you will, uh, for people to be on campus or not. Um, otherwise, I think there is an aspect of this kind of back to ivory tower. Uh, David, I don't know what you'd want to say about that. I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll give you the second one then. In this world of personalized learning, aren't we in danger of preparing students for a world where they feel they can make individual choices that are not so readily available when they enter, I think they mean the work world? Uh, shouldn't they learn to just simply conform sometimes? Oh, that's a good one. Um. So I suppose the answer to that is uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, of course. Uh, and, uh, but I'm I'm trying to think of this through the lens of uh, the uh, models that we've laid out here. And I'll I guess I'll just go back to uh, an observation I made very briefly before. Uh, in, and this is Staley's uh, uh, estimation. Uh, I think that the best form of teaching and learning is one on one, one teacher, one student. And as you add more students. To that mix, uh, I think that the quality of the education is diminished. Uh, and so uh, I'm happy to teach a seminar with a dozen or 20 students. Uh, when I start teaching 100 or hundreds of students, I think that the quality uh, of, of the education doesn't scale. And so uh, that's just my own sort of personal bias. One-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, mentoring, I think, is the, is the high, is the, is the, is the best form of learning. And in as much as my models uh, emphasize that, uh, that would that'd be the sort of conclusion I would draw. And I know we're right up against time, Jay. <laughs> right. Yes, I think I think also um, the other aspect to this is that one does have to consider if there are still some elements of foundational learning, if you will, 
So I know that, um, for instance, we, we spoke about when we speak about nomad uh, university, there is an aspect of sort of coming back to home base, if you will. So there is potentially some collective knowledge that is being built. Um, I'm not sure if it would necessarily be conformist, but the idea would be that there is a basis of understanding, if you will, and there is a kind of a, a collective foundation to, to many of the educational experiences, um, even at the higher education stage. Um, and actually, this, this might link up to the next question that I'm reading here, which is, is there a risk involved for the student when they are going to micro campuses that, in, in, that employers aren't familiar with, which operate on a model employers haven't heard of? And if so, how do you mitigate the risk of the degrees not being recognized? So I might, I might respond to this quickly and then send it on to you, David. Um, and I know that we're running out of time here. So the quick response is that one is hoping that these, ex these um, experiences are about creating those habits of mind and that a lot of the work descriptions also are now looking at students having skills of things like being, um, you know, being comfortable in ambiguity or being able to think on, you know, to work collaboratively. So those types of things are a little bit less about highly specific skills and more so about sort of attributes, if you will. Um. All I would say is redesigning the university involves at the same time uh, redesigning the market. Right. And we might have to send this right back to Hannah now because we're just at time. Thank you so much. Please, everyone, join me in sending a virtual round of applause to Jay and David. We will have a short pause in proceedings on this stage now, so to leave, please click the back button to be taken back to the agenda. Our final session will commence here in 10 minutes' time. Thank you. <laughs>